So um, before sundown in Israel today, for 25 hours about, there will not be one car found on the roads. You can walk on the highways of Israel and you will not be touched by a car or cars will not be driving. And you kind of wonder, why would that be? I mean, is there a threat? No, people will be out cycling. So why will they not be driving today? Why will all the shops be closed? Why is there nothing to do? And the answer is because of the Bible. It's what's called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And so we'll be looking at the Day of Atonement today and wondering what has it got to do with us? Um, well, the fact that it's in Scripture means it's got everything to do with us because even if we don't do what Jews do, it speaks about our Messiah. It's in the Word of God, and the Word of God says everything of Scripture, all Scripture, is given by inspiration, is God-breathed, and everything in Scripture, all Scripture, is profitable, including the scriptures about the Day of Atonement. In fact, in Leviticus 23, verse 27, it actually calls the Day of Atonement Yom HaKippurim. Yom HaKippurim, which means the Day of the Atonement's plural. It's plural in Hebrew. This is the one day of the year that's the most highly high, somber holiday of the whole Jewish calendar. It's the only day that God actually commanded a fast. And so tonight, before sundown, Jewish people will fast for 25 hours until um, sundown the next day. And um, Jewish people today will phone up anyone they can think of, or they will go up to anybody they can think of and say, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Now, when I say the Jewish people, I'm not meaning everybody. Only about, I think, from what I read, about 30% are really observant in Israel. The rest, 70%, enjoy the day off work. They go cycling, enjoy the, <laughs> enjoy the, the daylight, um, but 30% take it very, very seriously. And um, it's a day to really think that of even sins that you can't think of. And you're going up to people asking for forgiveness for things that you don't even know that you've done. So the idea of the Day of Atonement is it's the day that deals with things that the other sacrifices in the year never dealt with. And obviously that's speaking of the temple era. Today there is no temple, there are no sacrifices. So let's turn to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. I'm going to start with the first two verses. Leviticus chapter 16. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they came near the presence of Yahweh and died, and Yahweh said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark so that he will not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So this is happening after the death of Aaron's two sons. That's Nadab and Abihu. And we read about them in Leviticus chapter 10. And can anyone remember what happened to those two sons of Aaron? Uh, when he, obviously they died, because it says so here. But can it... So God had given a recipe for the incense that that the high priests were to offer to God. And what Nadab and Abihu said, decided to do is they would change the recipe. And simply because they changed the recipe, God killed them. Fire came out from God and consumed them. 
Because God actually says, I am holy and I will, I will be regarded as holy by those who come near to me. And in fact, when you look at verse 9 of the same chapter, God actually gives a commandment to the priesthood that while they're serving as priests, they're not to drink wine or strong drink. Wine would have been somewhat alcoholic, strong drink would have been much more alcoholic. And so the implication that Jewish exegetes had of, or Jewish Bible interpreters had of this, they kind of put two and two together and thought, well, probably Nadab and Abihu had been drinking, and so their, their judgment was impaired through drinking alcohol. So God actually puts a ban on the priesthood while they're serving God, nothing. You must come to this sober-minded. You must come to this with all your faculties intact and your brain switched on. And you must recognize the holiness of God and realize that God is not your casual friend that you're coming up to and say, yo, how's it going? He is your creator. He is your God. He is sinless. He is perfect. And he hates all sin. And sin is not just an issue for Israel that's to do with the wrong things they do in life. It's also the disregard for the holiness of God. Their casual, their casual nature towards God as they come into this temple where he comes in, in cloud to meet among his people. So much so that you couldn't just confess your sins. You had to deal with your ritual defilement. You had to cleanse your body physically. So maybe that's where we get this concept, cleanliness is next to godliness from. It's not, there's no scripture that says it, but when Israel came to God, they had to be physically clean as well as morally clean. It's not just um, clean hands and a pure heart in terms of I haven't done anything wrong. It was literally clean hands. The high priests had to clean continually their hands and feet because they were dealing with the blood of animals. They had to use incense to perfume God's presence so that he would smell it and be pleased. And so um, as we come back to this, in light of these two sons, God is saying to Aaron, Aaron, you're the high priest of Israel. There is nobody as close to me except you. Nobody who can come into my presence as far as you can. And you are not allowed to come into my holy of holies, except once a year. This is the God that we worship. You know, we sang before, take me past the outer courts, into the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face. We sang that this morning. Did we, did we sing it realizing we were not, not even... The highest, holiest Israelite was allowed to go in there. And we Gentiles weren't even allowed to go into the, the outer court. We were outside. Only because of Christ, we've been brought in. And it says in Scripture, let us approach the throne of grace boldly, only through the blood of Jesus. Without the blood of Jesus, you wouldn't dare come boldly before the throne of grace. It's pure grace that God has enabled us to be there. Now look at the high priest. He comes into the inside the veil. So that veil is this big curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies. And he comes before the mercy seat, which is on the ark. And that mercy seat had two cherubim facing each other. And the concept of that is it's the place that spoke of God's throne. It's the place of his glory. Round the throne in Isaiah 6 are seraphim. And we see in the book of Revelation when John is before the throne of God in his vision, he sees cherubim around the throne. God's throne has cherubim that are around it. And God's glory is between the cherubim. So it's a place that represents what is a reality in heaven. It represents what is a reality in heaven. And that's where God would meet. Now that mercy seat in Hebrew is called kaporet. 
And kaporet is from the word kafar, which where we get the word Yom Kippur from, the Day of Atonement. It's the thing that covers. The, the Kippur, the, the Atonement, is a covering. And the idea is it covers sin. Now inside the Ark, what do you have? You have the two tablets, which is the law, that condemns us because we have all broken it. And we have Aaron's rod, which budded. What, when, did his Aaron, when did Aaron's rod bud? When all the other priests were contending and saying, they're no special than us. You guys are no special than us. And so they all had to bring their rods, and God would show which high priest he chose. So that Aaron's rod is a reminder of the, pre the rebellion of the priesthood. And then you had in the manner that was from the wilderness in a jar. And what was that about? It was when God's people, Israel, complained, where we're going to get food to eat. There's condemnation for us inside that box. Not because God wants to condemn, but because he's holy. And we cannot stand before God, but praise the Lord, there is a kaporet, a mercy seat, covering it. And so when the high priest comes in, not only is that covered, but he will bring incense, as we'll see, and that covers as well, so that he is protected. So let's go on to verse 3 to 5. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, uh, with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are the holy garments. Then he shall bathe his water and put them on and he shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So what Aaron's got to do is he's got to wear special linen garments for that day. Now, if you know anything about the high priest, you'll know that normally he wore blue and he had a breastplate with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he had um, stones on his shoulder with six tribes on this side and six tribes on this side. And you saw that he wore a special turban with a plate, which the Bible translates it as crown, but the word actually means distinguishing mark, nezel. So the king had the distinguishing mark, he had a royal crown, the priest had the distinguishing mark, it was a golden plate, and on the plate it said, holy to the Lord. He looked like royalty, there were pomegranates and bells around the hem of his garment, and he looked like a king. But on this day, when he comes before the holy presence of God, he doesn't look like a king, he looks like a slave. He's just wearing plain white linen. Why? Because that high priest, though he is exalted among the people, he must be humble before a holy God. And so coming into the most holy place, he's stripped of his dignity and his honor as high priest. And he's still high priest, but he comes in lowly, recognizing that he's not just coming for the sins of the people. He has to come for his own sins first and foremost. Notice the bull is given for the priest's sins and probably that for of his family as well. And then the goats are given for the sins of the people. The bull comes first. He has to deal with his own sin first before he deals with the sins of the people. There was a process that they went through a week before the Day of Atonement, the high priest during the temple period would be away from his home for one week. And he would have his own special quarters in the temple. And he would do sacrifice. He would perform all the sacrifices that week. Now, in the, the rest of the year, other priests were killing the sacrifices. But on this day, the high priest did all the sacrifices. And the reason why they kept him in the temple was that he wouldn't get defiled at there. Because if he got defiled, he wouldn't be able to be the high priest for the, the Day of Atonement. And not just that, but they're so concerned that he might somehow die or be disqualified that they appointed another high priest just in case. Why? Because if this day is not done, Israel's sins are not covered for that year. 
It's the most important day in the Jewish calendar in terms of sacrifice. The rest of the year you're doing sacrifices, sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings. Every feast you're doing sacrifices. But when you come to this day, you still got sacrifices to do. Why? Because those sacrifices were not enough. They could not deal with all sin. Why? Because when you brought those other sacrifices, you, you confessed specific sins over your sin offerings. And what the Bible is showing is, you are more corrupt, more sinful than you realize. There are sins that I and you do that you don't even realize are sinful. And there is a remainder of sins that needs to be dealt with, which imp implies that the sacrificial system was not enough. Every year this has to be done. Why? Because last year's sacrifices are not enough. There has to be something else. And we know that that for us is Jesus our Messiah. He deals with sins that even the law couldn't deal with. Why? What did the law deal with? The law dealt with sins that you could repent of. But there were certain sins that sacrifices were not sufficient for, such as adultery. What sacrifice could you offer to God to atone for your adultery? What sacrifice could you offer to God to atone for your murder? What could you give? What would happen to a person who committed adultery or murder under the law? Stoned to death. There's no sacrifices that you could give. Isn't that why David, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, turned around and said, sin offering you've not required? If you wanted it, I would have given it. How was David saved from the sentence of death? He wasn't just guilty of adultery with Bathsheba. He had the chief of his army put the husband on the front line to take him out and say, withdraw, let the enemy kill him, so that when he dies, he can take Bathsheba as his wife. And when she has that baby that she conceived, he can pass it off as his own. How was he saved? Not by any animal sacrifice, but by the grace of God. It is the grace of God that saves where the law of Moses cannot. And so here is a reminder that there's hidden sins, the secret sins, the sins that I'm not even aware of. And God has to deal even with those. If we go on to verse, let's go to verse 6 to 10. Then Aaron shall bring near the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall bring near the goat on which the lot for Yahweh fell, and he shall offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement upon it to send it out into the wilderness as the scapegoat. So just to give you a bit of background, the Day of Atonement starts tonight, and if we live during the time of Israel, what would happen is people will be praying up till late at night, and then in the morning the high priest would get up, and in his normal clothing he would actually offer up the regular sacrifice. But he changes his clothes about five times that day continually bathing himself in a golden bath and continually washing his hands and feet. So it's, it, the priests always wash their hands and feet. To, but to bathe your body, your whole body more than once, shows how holy this is. Now when you get to the afternoon, this is when these sacrifices kick in. In fact, in Numbers 29 verses 7 to 11, you can read it at home you'll read that there's other sacrifices that were done besides these sacrifices here in Leviticus 16 and besides the regular sacrifices given. So this is a very, very solemn occasion. And what happens is the priest has to offer this bull up for himself and his household, and then he takes two goats. 
and they draw lots for them. And one is for the Lord, and one is for the, the Azazel, which is the scapegoat. And that is the one for the people. One of those goats will die, and one of them is going to be alive. And both the bull for the priest and these goats for the people, the priest will pray and confess. So over the bull, he prays and confesses his sins. And he'll be confessing for things he doesn't even know he's done. Lord, forgive me for that which I don't even know I've done. He'll be praying with that sentiment in mind. And as he lays his hand on that bull and confesses his sin, he will say three times God's holy name. My Bible, it says Yahweh. In your Bible, it will say Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you have a capitalized name, Lord, with all four letters capitalized, if you've got a literal translation of the Bible, you're dealing with God's very name. There's four letters in Hebrew. Yud, He, Vav, He. Ye, He, V, He. So we don't know how it's pronounced. No one's preserved the pronunciation. What we did, what we have in the Old Testament Hebrew, they take the vowels of the name Adonai, which means Lord, which is another word used for God. Adonai, a o a, and they put that with Yehovah, 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 where we get the name Jehovah from. It's a transliteration of Yehovah, Adonai. Jewish people today, when they pray to God, they will never say Yahweh. They will never say Yehovah. Never. They say Adonai. Why? Because they are scared of mispronouncing God's name. The people that put the vowels in the Hebrew did not preserve God's name. The high priest said this name three times in that prayer. Any other time, forbidden to use it. Now, I just want to address something because there is a false teaching about this by a guy called Richard Raw, who's a, he's a Catholic mystic. And this, this video has been put around on, on WhatsApp, and you possibly received it. And this guy claims that God's name doesn't actually have vowels in it. It is the sound of breathing. So it's like, yeah, yeah, or something like that. I can't. And they say that's the first, the first word you say when you wake up or when you're born is God's name. And the last name you say when you die is God's name. I'm sorry, unbelievers do not name the name of God when they die. The reason why there's no vowels is because they didn't preserve it, but the, but the high priest pronounced that name three times in that prayer, and he would never say that name at any other time, which says there was a way to pronounce that name. Richard Raw is someone that you really shouldn't listen to. He doesn't even believe Jesus took the punishment for our sin on the cross. He believes that's like cosmic child abuse, you know, because how could God like be punishing Jesus? No, he died to make us one with God. That's what he, he did. So atonement is not covering of sin. It's at one month to make us one with the Father, to make us one with God. This guy is a, a mystic. So I was just saying that to you. So if you get that, maybe you can share this teaching with them from YouTube. It's, it's, not someone, it's not someone we should listen to. But when you come to the two goats, he confesses the sins of the people, and um, he draws lots. The one goat is the sin offering that's going to be offered on the altar, and it, the body will be burned outside the camp <coughs> in a clean place, as we'll see. The other one is very interesting. It's called Azazel. And this word Azazel is a composite of two words. As or as, it means goat. And Azal means to go away. And so this idea is it's the goat that goes away. It's the goat that escapes. It's the escaping goat. William Tyndale, he translated it as scapegoat. And that's where the term was coined. Whenever you hear someone say, 
oh, you're just scapegoating me, or they're just treating him as a scapegoat, it actually comes from the Bible. You can actually, with your unsafe friends, when they talk about a scapegoat, you can say, do you know where that term comes from? And they might say, no, where does it come from? It comes from the Bible and use it to share the gospel. They might look at you really weird while you're bringing this up, but it's an opportunity to share the gospel with someone because as we'll see, Jesus is our scapegoat. And what they'll do is they will tie a scarlet thread around one of the horns. In fact, a lot of pictures you'll see of the scapegoat, you'll see it across the forehead tied to both horns. If you go on, on Google and, and um, put scapegoat in. And then someone will take that scapegoat out. So let's read that in verses 11 um, to verse, actually verse 20 to 22. When he finishes making atonement for the holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring near the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it, all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins, and he shall lay on them, lay them on the head of the goat and send it out into the wilderness by the hand of the men ready to do this. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an isolated land. That word isolated there is gezara, which means, which means cut off. It's something cut off from everybody. In fact, because it had to be a cut-off place, when Israel grew in population and they weren't able to take that goat far enough to get it away from everybody, they would take it to a cliff and push it off backwards. So the goat would end up dying. But the original concept was the goat would go away and live and go far away. In fact, 16 kilometers away from people into the wilderness. In other words, Far away, God takes Israel's sins and he says, I'm taking them far away from you. As, as the east is as far as the west, so God has taken away our iniquities from us, or removed our sins from us. It ties in with the scapegoat. The scapegoat doesn't just signal that our sins have been paid for and have been punished on the goat, but it also includes that God actually removes our sins. And here's the challenge for us. We love the concept of forgiveness. We want to know we're forgiven so we can live with God and we don't have to be suffering punishment for our sin. But scripture doesn't just talk about forgiveness. It also talks about cleansing. It says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Salvation is the easiest thing in the world because we're saved by putting our faith and trust in Jesus. But what faith are we putting in Jesus? That he died for our sins. And why did he die for our sins? Because God hates sin and he has to punish it. Jesus dies in our place. If we really believe that, and we really believe what God thinks about our sin, how can we come by faith to God and say, God, please forgive me of our sin, my sins, but I don't want to turn from them. I'm pretty happy living the way I am. I don't want you to change my life, but I do want you to forgive me. What kind of faith is that? Real faith is a repentant faith. It's a faith that says, God, I am turning away from these things that displease you. I'm turning away from my old life and I want to follow you. That's biblical faith. Faith and repentance in the book of Acts go hand in hand together. You can't really separate them. You see, we want the forgiveness. Why? Because we don't want to be punished. But the question is, do we want the cleansing? The blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness. God forgives everything. It says in that wonderful hymn by Charles Wesley, the vilest sinner, the vilest sinner who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Didn't um, John, um, John Newton write the hymn Amazing Grace? 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you know when he wrote that, he stopped selling slaves. He didn't write this amazing grace, here am I in this slave trade, and praise the Lord, I'm forgiven, and I'll continue selling these slaves. He repented. He turned from that path, and God forgave everything. Cleaned, washed, accepted. No judgment for sin on you, even though you did all those things. But you're not just forgiven, you are also cleansed. There is a cleansing that is connected to the Day of Atonement. The sacrifices were for the cleansing of the people and for the altar of sacrifice. You'll actually see it in verse 33 and verse 34. He makes atonement for the holy sanctuary and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall also make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. Now this you'll have as a perpetual statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. It's not just for the people though. It was for the holy sanctuary. It was for the tent of meeting and it was for the altar. Why? Because the defilement, the sinful, the sinful acts of the people and their defilement would defile even God's holy things. And sometimes we think, well, if God's holy and his things are holy, then nothing can really defile them. But in the tabernacle, it was the case that those things got defiled. And I think it's a picture of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But if we're not dealing with things in our lives, we bring in malice and bitterness and unforgiveness and it's going to defile the body of Christ. So there's a parallel here. Now let's look at what this means for us. Firstly, I just want to look at this one verse that I didn't look at and it's in verse, between verses 29 and verse 30. And it says, this shall be a perpetual statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or sojourner who sojourns among you. For it is on that day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before Yahweh. The word humble there, the King James says afflict, and it's a very good translation, because it's the word that means to make you suffer. In other words, you were to fast. Your, you were to fast and make yourself suffer through your fasting. And you'll see that in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. This Ezra 8, verse 21. <coughs> the concept of fasting was to afflict your soul. In other words, you could translate it, torture your soul. Now, Jewish people wish each other an easy fast. May your fast be easy. But the concept of fasting was not that it would be easy, but that it would be hard and you would really suffer. In fact, um, my friend Karmit, um, she was saying on Friday, she's from Israel, that as kids, when they were growing up, they would have a competition to see whose tongue was the whitest. Because if you're not eating or drinking anything, apparently your tongue goes white. So if your tongue wasn't white, ah, you've been cheating. You know, that was basically, it's human nature, isn't it? We want to compete with each other and see who's the best. But the concept is you suffer. And that's why Jesus says, when you fast, don't look haggard. Take oil and anoint yourself and make yourself look bright so that no one can see that you've been fasting. Why? Because fasting would make you look haggard. Let make you look tired and weak. That's the whole concept, that you suffer. So if you have this concept, oh, I'm going to fast, I'm, I'm going to cut out my chocolate out of my diet. That will be my fast. It's not a fast. Fast is not just getting um, one nice thing, but it's about really getting yourself serious. Now, there was a fast Daniel did. And what he did is he refrained from any rich food and any wine of the king. And the reason was he was seeking God in order 
that God would bring about his purposes for Israel. In order that God would bring his purposes, he was seeking God for God's restoration of the people of Israel. So the concept of fasting is this. And it's, it's not like a means to get power. It's not like if you fast, you're going to get power from God. That's not why people fasted. Why they fasted is because you eat when you are happy. When you're at a, 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 when you're at a wedding, you can't fast. Why? Because it's happy, it's joyous, you're to celebrate. When you fast, it's because you're grieving. It's because you've got a burden. So when David's son was going to die, remember he had that relationship with Bathsheba, and the son was born and God saying, I'm going to take his life. He fasted. Why? Because it was a burden to him. He wanted this child to live. He can't eat. It's so important. That's the concept of fasting. You are making yourself suffer to do business with God so that God may hear your cries and forgive your sins. In other words, fasting means it's not business as usual. Fasting means, God, I need time with you because this is just too much of a burden. God, I'm seeking you to intervene in the situation so that God sees that you mean business with him. That God sees that this is more important than you enjoying life. It's a burden to you. That's the concept of fasting. God only commanded fasting once a year on this day of atonement. And so, as we take this to ourselves, we realize that we too, you know, when you get saved, I remember the night I got saved, and I'll be sharing my testimony in a few weeks, but I wept that night, and I don't normally, I mean, as a kid, I used to cry all the time because <laughs> I was soft. <laughs> but I didn't really weep too much. And that night was different to all other weepings because other times I'd weep because I was hurt and someone said something against me or did something to me, so I'd cry. That night I didn't cry because of what I felt about me but because of what I did against God. That's why I wept that night. And I knew I was not right. I knew that without the cross, I'm going to a lost eternity. No one had to tell me the gospel that night. I knew the gospel. And so I'm not saying that your tears have to be physically expressed, but what I am saying is when you get saved and you're convicted of sin, you realize what you have done against a holy God. And it's not business as usual. There's something very profound about our salvation because you're going from death to life. You're going from sin to righteousness. That's our salvation. This was to be a complete Sabbath, not to do any work whatsoever. It was a day wholly dedicated to God. So when we get saved, that's what happens with our lives. What is Sabbath about? Sabbath is about turning away from your work and resting from your work. What are our works? Our works are dead works. Even our righteous works, all our righteousness is as a filthy garment before God. And so when we get saved, it's a Sabbath of complete rest for us in Christ. Why? Because we rest from our works, our dead works, to find life in Christ. And we are very much like the, 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 the Azazel, the scapegoat. If we turn back to, let's go to verse 9 of Leviticus 16. And it says, Then Aaron shall bring near the goat on which the lot for Yahweh fell, and he shall offer it as a sin offering. I don't know what your Bible translations read there, but literally... In the Hebrew, it says, Ve'asahu chatat. Ve'asahu chatat. Asa is to do something or to make something. So literally, to translate that, and you recognize the word chatat means sin, it says the, he makes it, the goat, sin. He makes the goat sin. The word sin there implies the sin offering. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Let 
God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin. Jesus had no experience of sin. He never did one sin. He never succumbed to any temptation by the devil or by anyone else. He, does not, he did not know what it felt like to sin. He had no intimate knowledge of sin. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <coughs> the same phrase used about the goat. The high priest makes the goat sin. He, he makes the goat, in a sense, become sin, i.e. the sin offering. It's the same phrase used about Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus was made sin. What this verse does not mean is that Jesus became sinful. And some people teach this, especially in the Word of Faith crowd, they teach Jesus became one nature with Satan on the cross. And they teach that Jesus became this, um, this little, wormy, poured out soul. And they really denigrate Jesus on the cross because of this verse. And also because of, you know, the snake being lifted up on the staff in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. And they, make, they basically say, he became like Satan. No, Jesus became our sin offering. And the sin offering was that which was standing in place of the sinner. In other words, the goat gets killed instead of the person getting killed. So Christ gets killed and judged and takes the wrath and punishment of our sins in our place as our sin offering. He becomes sin so that we might become righteous. In other words, he gets treated as the sinner, though he was not a sinner, so that we can be treated as the righteous one, even though we were not the righteous. It's a transfer of, 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 of position. I go from, I, I step out of being the sinner, and Jesus steps in there and God says, you're the sinner, but he never did anything wrong. And he steps out of the role of being the righteous one, and we step into that role. There's a transfer. He takes our life to the cross. We take his life and walk with it. And so we, the Lord looks at us, just as the cloud would have covered the, 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 the ark in the Holy of Holies. And when the priest comes in with the, the sacrifice, what God sees and what the high priest sees is lots of smoke. Lots of incense. The high priest cannot see. And it's almost like God cannot see. And what is the incense made from? It was incense that was poured onto the coals that were taken from the altar of sacrifice. So the only way the priest can come in is by incense with something taken from the altar of sacrifice which symbolizes to you and me that the only way we can stand before God is prayerfully because of the sacrifice of Christ. When we come to God by faith, we pray to him. We confess him with our lips. He is Lord. We believe God raised him from the dead. And we are saved because that prayer, that confession of our lips is rooted in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as sinners. He sees the sacrifice of his sons. And it's almost like that cloud representing that prayer from the sacrifice is what God sees when he looks at us. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And therefore we are wholly accepted before the Father. The bull and the sin offering goat had to be slaughtered so that this goat could go free. And isn't that what Jesus did for us? We are like the scapegoat. Jesus is like the scapegoat because he takes our sins away from us. But we are also like the scapegoat. Why? Because the scapegoat was presented alive and was a living sacrifice. And Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, says, because of the mercies of God, where the other goat gets killed, Jesus gets killed. On the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. You know, and I think this is where I need to finish. When we look at Christ and what he did on the cross, it is a message that is most welcome. I think there are very few people within Christianity that don't embrace the superficial concept of a crucified Christ. Catholics have that um, crucifix in every single Catholic building. It's accepted. Now, Jesus rose from the dead. He's not on the cross anymore. So, But they accept that. And they even accept an identification with Christ in that sense that they accept that you, you have to suffer for your sins and they even believe in purgatory. But I think there's a truth twisted here. And it's twisted because we can't pay the price for our sins. We can't go to purgatory and pay for the rest of our sins. We do not contribute to our salvation one iota. What Christ did on the cross is sufficient for all sin. And there's nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. Not one thing. We accept it as a free gift. And if you accept what Christ did on the cross and you repent and you turn away from this life and you embrace his life, everything is clean. And if you died a second later, you would be going to live with Christ forever. Nothing you need to do. But the Christian life is a package deal. You don't accept God on your own terms. As if, I'll accept Jesus and I can live the way I want, but I'm going to heaven. It's not like that. It's, that's not the salvation he's given. It's like this. I have a phone that, say, a friend of mine, he pays the contract for. But then I want to put a Vodacom SIM card in this phone but the phone's locked into MTN. Is the phone free or does it cost me? It's free for me. It doesn't cost me anything. Somebody else is paying the contract. But can I just take another SIM card and swap it in there? No, I can't. It's locked in. That phone that came with that SIM card is locked into that network. So when we accept Christ, salvation is free, the price has been paid, there's nothing you can contribute. But the nature of the salvation we've been given is a life. He's given us new life. We are born again. And that new life is a life that is from Christ. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with God. And to know God means we respond to him. He speaks, we say amen. He points to something, we repent. It's an interactive relationship. Which means that I can't come to God thinking, I'll get a good life and live my life the way I want, and I'll have Jesus as well. It's not like my life and Jesus. What it is is Jesus is my life. And so what does Jesus say? Anyone who come after me, let him, let him do this. Take up his cross and follow me. In fact, if you turn lastly to Hebrews chapter 13. And Hebrews has a lot to say about the, the Day of Atonement, and we just don't have time to go through it. But I'd encourage you to read and um, maybe you can write these scriptures down. But Hebrews, should be Hebrews chapter 9. Maybe read the whole chapter, but it's, it writes about the sin offering there uh, and, uh, and the, um, the, the Day of Atonement, going into the most holy place. But in Hebrews chapter 13, it says in verse 11 and 12, the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. So once the high priest has offered 
what needs to be offered and taken out of that sin offering, what needs to be taken out and given the blood. The rest of the animal gets burned in a clean place outside the camp. And so he says in verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. In other words, Jesus wasn't crucified in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. He was on the outskirts. He was outside the camp. It wasn't in the temple. Jesus was not in the temple being offered on the, heart, on the, the altar of sacrifice. He was outside the camp, which speaks of his rejection. He was rejected as the carcass of the sin offering was a rejected thing. So Jesus was rejected for you and me. But look what it says, verse 13. So let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. In other words, that sin offering is not just something that applies to Jesus and we just get to enjoy the benefits thereof. We are also like sin offerings. We are also to endure rejection, persecution, shame. You know, the, 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 the scapegoat, when they took that out, they developed a practice where they started spitting at it and whipping it and chasing it out of the town. Why? Because it embodied the sin of the people. And when, and when Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, it is your worship. It implies, when you look at it in light of the sin of the, the Azazel, the scapegoat, it implies that we are to be willing to endure suffering and rejection and persecution for Jesus' name's sake. And I've been so challenged by the testimony of a lady who was martyred in 203 AD. She and a number of others um, were, were, were fed to the, to the wild animals for, to, to celebrate the emperor's birthday, and they made it illegal for any new converts to, to, to convert to Christianity. And so what did she do? Well, she's from a very rich background, she was actually born to a, a wealthy guy, and when baby girls were born, they were presented at the feet of the father, and the father would decide whether he wanted to keep her or, or not keep her. And if she was not kept, she would be put out on a stone to die. The father took her and actually regarded her better than his own sons. And she also received tuition in Latin, and Greek. She was educated where other girls would not be educated. That was what her father thought about her. And she got married and had a baby. And not long after having the baby, I think she, she was in the process of conversion to Christianity. And let me, I, I need to share this because it just blew my socks. At that time, it took maybe up to three years before you could convert to Christianity. In the Bible time, straight away. But as time went on, the persecution grew. They wanted to make sure Christians knew what they were in for. To become a Christian meant for, for, for a convert. They had full understanding and full knowledge. Becoming a Christian means that tomorrow my head may be on the block. Imagine if we brought that into Christianity in South Africa. How empty would our churches be? And so she went through this process. She has a baby, I think a baby boy. She has a baby. And she's ready to, I, I don't know when they converted, but once you've gone through those classes, you basically got baptized. When you got baptized, you basically renounced the devil and the world and you, have your clo you take your clothes off, you're baptized naked, you go into that water, you come out of that water, you put on fresh, clean, white clothes. It's black and white. That's my old life, this is my new life, and that new life is a life that might lead me to the cross. That was understood. And before she got to that point, they were captured by the Roman by the Romans, and they were imprisoned, and they were going to be fed to wild beasts. Because she was of good standing, the father was trying to persuade her, recant from the faith. And he loved his daughter, and he was saying to his daughter, like, 
have a care for me. At least have a care for your baby. And she said to him, do you see that over there? What is it? He says, it's a vase. She said to her father, can it be called by any other name? The father said, no. And she said, well, neither can I be called by any other name than a Christian. When she went to the wild animals, she went, not saying, I'm the daughter of so-and-so and I'm of this wealth. She only went as a Christian. It was the only boast that she had was Christ. They sped up their conversion. They, they basically, she went through the initiation in jail so that she went out to the beast. Being in, having cut her education short, and a number of them had dreams before they were fed to the wild animals. The certain beliefs they had that I don't know if they're true or not, but one thing that it did really, really struck me was they believed that they had a special connection to God because they were going to be martyred. For them, martyrdom was not an evil, but a welcome guest. For them, martyrdom meant God you are so honoring me that you give me the privilege of dying for you. And when she was attacked by, I can't remember what the animal was, after she asked, when is that animal going to attack me? She said, it already has. She had no knowledge that she, she had, didn't feel anything. It doesn't mean that she didn't feel anything at all. It's just in that moment she didn't feel anything. These believers had a completely different understanding of salvation than you and I. You know, in this town, probably, there are churches that say, come to Jesus for your best life now. God's got a wonderful plan for your life. But for them, the wonderful plan for their life is they got the privilege of giving their life up for the Lord. If we had just an inch of that, if we realized that Jesus was our sin offering and our scapegoat. But we are to be identified with him in his sufferings and his death. We would be such a force for the Lord in this town. We would be instruments that God would use to expand his kingdom. To truly put it this way, he said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. After those people were killed, guess what? Christianity spread and grew. Christianity doesn't spread in time of affluence. It spreads in times of suffering. And I'm not saying that you should jump into the theater and throw yourself to the animals. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if there should always be that willingness, Lord, if you call me to that, I embrace it. I don't know if I'm there yet. If we're honest, if we had to ask ourselves, aren't we there? Could I just step out in front and say, go singing hymns while everybody's cheering and shouting and saying, you you atheist, because if you didn't believe in the other gods, you were an atheist. You hater of mankind. You who are bringing division in the Roman Empire. You refuse to worship Caesar as God. We want you dead. Can you stand there and say, thank you, Lord? That's the challenge. And to me, it shows that there has to be a grace of the Lord. You know, the Day of Atonement is this. Christ suffered so that we can be forgiven. But the blood of the martyrs is of the seed of the church. In other words, not that we suffer for other people's sins like Christ did, but through our embracing of the hardship that comes with our salvation and giving our life for the Lord, the Lord might grow his church. And so it might not come to us, but it's certainly coming to our brothers and sisters. You think of Northwest and North Korea, Sudan. You think of China in places where Christians are very much persecuted, even though there's a lot more liberty than there used to be. If you think about um, Afghanistan, you think about Pakistan, these are our brothers and sisters 
who are, who are suffering for the faith. And this is why we remember them, because they're our teachers. And it's not like they have nothing to learn from us, but it means we've got a lot to learn from them. And so this Day of Atonement, may we just recognize what Christ did for us as our scapegoat and our sin offering, but we also called to identify with his suffering. And it's only the grace of God that can enable us to do that.